Okay, everyone, good afternoon. My name is Ashley Fobb, and I am the Director of Development and Communications for the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge, and we're excited to have you join our Create You webinar series. This is a professional development webinar series designed for artists and arts organizations in the 11 parishes that we serve here at the Arts Council. For more information on the Arts Council, please um, visit artsvr.org and you can learn more about membership and benefits, programming, volunteer opportunities, and especially the upcoming Ebb and Flow Festival, April 6th and 7th. So just a few housekeeping rules. Um, please make sure whenever you enter the uh, webinar, you're automatically muted, but just make sure you stay muted on your phone and your computer throughout uh, so we do not have any disruptions. And then second, we're going to have a question and answer uh, session after the uh, webinar presentation. So please send your questions. If you look on the bottom of your screen, there's a chat icon. You can click that and those questions come directly to me. And at the end of the presentation, I will uh, facilitate that question and answer session. So please, if you have anything throughout the session, please send me those questions and we will try to answer them as time allows. So without further ado, let's get started. We are so excited to have Andre Dubrock. He is a performing artist with a degree in entrepreneurship from the University of Minnesota. He has integrated his abilities to lead a rich and fruitful life as a performing artist and a success successful businessman. In his workshop, he'll share some tips and tricks and best practices he's learned along his eclectic career path. So we are very honored to have you, Andre. And, um, Take it away. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Andre DeBrock, and I'm doing a presentation with you all today uh, about uh, the entrepreneurial artist, of creating a sustainable business model as an artist. Uh, you will notice from my PowerPoint presentation that I am not a visual artist. I am uh, a performing artist, uh, and also uh, mo mostly these days a writer. Um, so, uh, I will try to be charming, but I'm not going to uh, be very pretty. How's that? Uh, so, anyway, off we go. The entrepreneurial artist creating a sustainable business model as an artist or, or, uh, I am trying to, there we go. Seriously, can I make a living at this? Okay. So, we're going to dive right in. For those of you that have taken, uh, business classes in the past. Some of this might be uh, a good reminder uh, about how we apply business practices to being an artist. First, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Andre Dubrock. That's me. I am bald. And I have a BFA in theater performance from Webster University in Marymount Manhattan College. That was a long time ago. And more recently, I have a, a, a bachelor's of science in entrepreneurship from um, the uh, University of Minnesota, where it is very cold. I have been an actor, a musician, a teacher, a loan officer, a, gre a circus clown, a greeting card writer, a copywriter, creative director, editor, playwright, cook, singer, composer, lecturer, activist, fundraiser, publisher, author, and production manager. So. Uh, but I'm not an expert. I don't believe in experts. Uh, if the world were filled with experts, we wouldn't have all the problems we have. Uh, however, I have experience, and I can talk certainly about that. Uh, and much of this presentation is uh, uh, stuff that I've learned from experience, from reading, uh, and from practicing. Um, so, what does it mean to be an artist? Well, the definition of being an artist is pretty uh, uh, clean cut according to the dictionary. Yeah, it's one who's skilled or versed in the learned arts. Uh, of course, those of us that uh, function as artists know that it's uh, far more uh, complicated. And generally we all have our own definition and that's fine. But there are uh, the big seven uh, that are uh, recognized by the industry and uh, by universities. And those big seven are architecture, sculpture, painting, music, literature, my favorite, performing, and film. And it can also be a combination of any or all of those. Uh, so I imagine most of you that are listening in 
um, are uh, uh, represent one of these big seven or, or possibly uh, a cross between several of them, which is awesome. So what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? Well, that's one who organizes, manages, and assumes the risk of a business or enterprise. Now, entrepreneur is a, uh, a French derivative word that essentially means the first to enter. Um, if you're the first to enter anything, uh, particularly the lion's cage, it takes some bravery. Entrepreneurs themselves have uh, attributes, and those attributes are that they're creative, they're passionate, they're motivated, they're optimistic, they're future-oriented, they're persuasive, they're flexible, resourceful, adventurous, and decisive. Uh, for those of you that are artists, you probably are looking at, at this list like you do the horoscope and go, that's me. Well, that's true. A lot of artists are, at heart, entrepreneurs. Um, so, one big difference between most entrepreneurs and some artists has to do with where our internal locus of control comes from, or whether we have one. An internal locus of control is one's belief that they are in charge of themselves and their circumstance, that I control my future, I control my well-being, I am in control of where my career is going. Um, However, the opposite of internal locus of control is external locus of control. That's the one's belief that an external force determines their fate or circumstances. I meet um, a lot of artists, and I'm sure you have too, that um, are uh, in this uh, uh, place, uh, this limbo of waiting to be discovered, waiting for my work to be recognized, um, the waiting place, um, they are generally functioning from a place of external locus of control. And that's not a very entrepreneurial approach to one's career. Um, un unless you have uh, some really diehard fans that are gonna get out there and do the work for you, um, it's, uh, it's important to really question your own internal locus of control. So say that you've determined, okay, I'm gonna take charge of, of my career as an artist, whether I'm a visual artist or a performing artist, if I'm a writer, I'm a singer, I'm a comedian, I'm a dancer. The first thing that you need to do is take a look around you. What is the environment? Where are you living at? What is the market capacity for an artist where I live? Uh, where, where can I perform or where can I sell my work? A a am I selling a good or a service? You know, visual artists, sculptors, painters, um, they generally are selling goods. It's, it's hard to think of your work that way, but it is. You are selling a physical, tangible object. Whereas performing artists or uh, uh, dancers or, or writers, uh, in my case, uh, you know, that you are selling a service. Um, so taking a look around uh, at your, the market capacity of where you live is very important. Also, you need to, to take a look around and try to identify what am I competing with? And that doesn't necessarily mean that, um, oh, you know, I wanna start a theater company in my town and I'm gonna compete with the other theater company in town. There are much bigger competitors to a theater company. You know, Netflix is a huge competitor to a, a, a theater. Or um, if you're a, a, a visual artist just starting out, you know, what else are you competing with? You know, you might be competing with uh, the fact that, that people don't like to go to galleries. So you also need to look at doing a SWOT analysis and I'll get into that a little bit further. Uh, those of you that have taken business class, you'll be familiar with the SWOT analysis. That's an acronym. It, start, it stands for strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. And uh, I'll talk you through that process. But 
what you're ultimately trying to land on by scanning your environment is determine what is my advantage? What is my competitive advantage as an artist where I live in the marketplace and how do I capitalize on that competitive advantage? So let's start with what, what is the market capacity of an artist? You know, these are things that you should probably sit down and write for yourself. Who is willing to pay for my goods or services? How much are they willing to pay? What is my personal capacity? I mean, how, I, you know, particularly if I'm, if I'm an actor or a performer, um, I can only do so many shows or so many performances in a month. What does that look like financially? If I'm a visual artist or a sculptor or I do ceramics, I can only produce a certain amount per month. How much do I need to, to live on? And, and how much can I expect to sell? And how much can I sell? These are all questions that you need to ask yourself about market capacity. And uh, always keep in, in mind uh, you know, the supply and demand of where it is that you live. You know, you know, how many audiences can you reach? How many audiences with, with money in their pockets are going to actually uh, 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 buy your goods or services? These are important things to, to really keep in mind. Uh, and again, it's difficult as an artist to, to think about our work in those terms, but you're the sole proprietor of a business now. That business just happens to be your name. And so you need to step back and uh, really look at the marketplace around you, that environment. It's a very, very important step. All right, so your SWOT analysis analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This is a fun exercise, uh, particularly for those of us that struggle with decision making. I, I, I do this with, with, <laughs> with simple decisions, uh, like even like planning on where to go on vacation. You can make a chart and you know, analyze your found findings. And the chart looks something like this. You have your strengths. These are good questions to ask yourself. What do you do well? And what are your advantages? What resources do you have? And what do people prefer you, uh, why do people prefer you or your work? Um, really it comes down to what are you proud of? As an artist, when you, when you talk about your work or you see your work, what are you most proud of? Now, on the other side of that is your weakness. What could you improve? What do you do poorly or not at all? You, know, uh, you might be a fantastic painter, but, uh, but you're a terrible bookkeeper. Uh, or you might be a, a, a terrific actor uh, who has a tendency to um, overextend themselves. Do you have a sufficient budget? You know, at the end of the day, we all have rents to pay and uh, bills. You know, so what is it that you need to sustain yourself that way? And what do you have left over to, to work on your weakness, you know, to, uh, to improve? How are your communication skills? Um, anybody in any business needs to understand that uh, you're always uh, communicating uh, something uh, with everyone that you meet, you want uh, you're forming relationships with uh, every handshake, with uh, every email, with every social media post. Um, particularly if you, as the sole proprietor of this business that is your name, those communication skills come uh, become much more important. Um, I guess weaknesses really come down to asking yourself, what are you ashamed of? You know. Um, I wish that uh, I, I was uh, better at self-motivation. I, I would probably say that that was my biggest weakness uh, because there are certain things I know I have to do, and if I don't want to do them, I drag my heels. Um, so then, opportunities. This is part of that that uh, identifying where your 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 niche is. What's the best you can hope for in the near future? And plan it out six months from now. You know, six months from now, 
I would like to sell X amount of dollars of my, uh, of my ceramics. I would like to sell this many paintings or I would like to show this many exhibits within this time frame. Identify what the busy times and seasons are. Uh, this is true for, for performing artists as well as uh, for um, uh, 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 artists that, that create tangible goods. Um, generally, you know, around the holidays, there's always a play, there's always a ballet, there's always uh, a market or a holiday market. This is gonna be a busy time of year, but within all of that, there are other busy times. So uh, being able to identify those are all very important. What is the trend or niche that you are following or establishing? Who are you aligning yourself with uh, within the market? Um, if you are a, a, a visual artist, what galleries out there best uh, align with your particular style? Because that's where you're going to find your, uh, your buyers or, or at least your audience. So within opportunities, that all comes down to what makes you excited? You know, what gives you hope? What, uh, what motivates you? On the other side of that are your threats. What obstacles do you plan to face? You know, uh, I, I'll, I'll know, I, I can, I'll give you your first one. The first one's always rejection. Rejection, rejection, rejection. And, then, and, and that's the nature of the business that we're in, but we have to learn to make rejection our friend. We have to laugh at rejection. We have to take rejection out for a drink and have a good time with rejection because that's just the, that's the nature of the business that we're in. Uh, what is going to be the slow time or season? Uh, this, is, um, uh, this is Louisiana and it gets hot during the summer and people don't like to leave their houses in the summer because all that wonderful AC is in there. Um, what competition are you facing? That goes back to, to scanning the environment. What, and that competition is anything that's pulling your audience's attention away from you. Essentially, the threats come down to what worries you. So just real quick, what are you proud of? What are you ashamed of? What makes you excited and what worries you? That's your SWOT analysis. And I think it's really a, a really important step in uh, examining yourself as an artist uh, trying to create a sustainable business model. Moving on. Now you get to, with that information, you can build yourself a personal mission statement. This is the thing that you're gonna post on your wall and you're going to, to make it your creed. And it can change over time, but, and generally I would structure it like this. I need to utilize my strength to take advantage of my opportunity and work on my weakness to compete with my threat. This is, uh, uh, this is kind of your, your, your motto, your slogan, what's going to, to, to keep you moving forward. And um, ultimately that's, you know, that is the, uh, the result of your SWOT analysis is to land on a personal mission statement. So now that you've done that, that personal mission statement was really what we would call internal communication. That's for you and your eyes or your inner circle. Now this is all about how do you communicate that outwards to your audiences. So what is it exactly that you do? What's your story? What are your descriptors? And what is your elevator speech? Um, I, I used to work with students and they'd have to develop elevator speeches. And it's like, well, how many floors are we going? Because I feel like we're like, <laughs> we've reached the 98th floor and you're still talking. Um, I prefer elevator speeches that are one floor. Um, so let's uh, dive into these. What are your descriptors? The descriptors are the words that you would describe your services, your talent, your diet desirability, your, your product. Um, these are what will entice your audience to ask questions. You know, make sure that if you are enticing your audience to ask questions that you have the answers, quick answers to explain yourself. 
let your cleverness shine, but be honest and make sure it's language that the language is it's not polarizing. Um, in other words, you know that nobody's going to take issue with what you you've written. Like uh, uh, on my business card, it says my descriptors are word monkey, storyographer, and creative counselor. It would have been easier for me to write, you know, uh, writer, author, and and uh, 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 creative consultant, but this is more interesting and it's honestly, you know, more how I regard myself. So I suggest, you know, that you try to come up with at least three descriptors, something that'll fit on a business card so that, you know, they know what service or, or what goods you're supplying and also gives them a nod to who you are. Let all your charmingness come out in your descriptors. Then your elevator speech. Keep it short. Keep it provocative. Keep it casual. Keep it short. Again, I can't uh, uh, tell you. People, uh, people don't listen or find us nearly as interesting as we would like <laughs> them to find us. So, uh, but they do enjoy brevity. Uh, uh, be intriguing. Provocative. Start the conversation. So when people ask me what it is that I do, I say, well, I make my living writing for casual readers who like inappropriate humor and uncomfortable stories. Now, that's very short. And generally, uh, people will start asking questions and we begin a conversation because I've written that strategically for them to ask questions. And uh, so I, I would suggest to all of you uh, to, to think about what it is that you do as an artist and try to, to, to create that, that one or two sentences that's going to start the conversation and be very concise. The next step, of course, is really understanding who is your audience. Now, um, performing artists often think that the audience are uh, the people that, that sit in the house and have bought tickets and are paying money to see you. But if you really think about it, that primary audience is not them because they didn't hire you. The primary audience are the ones who hold the purse. Uh, in other words, that primary audience are uh, casting agents, uh, theater owners, producers. Uh, that same, for most performing artists, that's, that's who your primary audience is. Um, for, uh, uh, artists, uh, uh, visual artists, that primary audience might be gallery owners. Um, uh, for writers like, like myself, it's, it's, edit, uh, it's publishers and editors and um, uh, anyone out there willing to pay money to someone to write for them. That secondary audience, however, those are the ones who influence the ones who hold the purse and they're important too. You know, if uh, a producer knows that you have a, a large fan base, um, you know, they'll be more inclined to hire you because they're being influenced by the people who are buying tickets. Um, same thing with gallery owners. If you have a showing in a gallery and, you know, they have one of the biggest turnouts they've ever had, they're going to be much more inclined to uh, invite you back and other gallery owners are going to take notice of that as well. The tertiary, uh, tertiary audience, those are your admirers and allies. I'm gonna get more into that. So like I said, primary audience, who holds the checkbook? It's the casting agents, the gallery owners, the licensors and licensees, particularly for visual artists, uh, licensing your work uh, is can be so lucrative. And actually I've, I found that now as a, a writer as well. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later, but licensing what I do, uh, I, I'm getting paid for work I've done years and years ago. And that's fantastic. Cause I, I like, I think surprise money is some of my favorite money out there. Um, publishers, producers, customers, that's your primary audience. Secondary audience, the ones who influence the ones who hold the checkbook. Colleagues, industry professional, uh, professionals, 
influencers. Um, social media, uh, of course, is making a big deal out of, of it. They actually have the name for it, the influencers. We're gonna run an influencer campaign. These are not people who will ever buy your product, but boy, a word from them, and then all of a sudden you, you've got consumers knocking down your door. And then the tertiary audience uh, it could be audiences, it could be friends, it could be family, casual acquaintances, et cetera. It's really up to you. You know your environment. You know what it is that you do. You know who those faces are that, that uh, uh, appreciate your work. It's being able to, to determine out of those faces who is it that holds the checkbook. That's your primary audience. Who is it that's influencing the person that holds the checkbook? That's your secondary audience. And then who are the people that are just going to speak nice to you and show up? That's your tertiary audience. Of course, now that you've got these audiences, you've got to figure out, you know, you've got your audience, you know what it is that you want to say. You have your elevator speech, you have your descriptors, you, uh, you know where you want to be and, and, and how you want things to play out because you've done your SWOT analysis. So now you have to figure out how am I going to reach them? So what platforms do your audiences use the most? And what collateral do you need to reach them? And how do you stay top of mind? So, you know, you can find audiences in most places. And certainly every marketing company out there knows where audiences live down to, uh, th thanks to social media, particularly uh, uh, the Facebooks and the, the Twitters and the Instagrams that they can uh, really pinpoint, you know, down to the date of birth, uh, who your followers are. Of course, you know, I'm not suggesting that you do anything that drastic, but be aware of what's most effective or the most effective places to reach your audience. For instance, if, um, if you are a, a, a performing artist, say that you're a, a dancer and um, you have a, a performance coming on, well, of course you're going to post it on social media. Now, if you're performing in the Nutcracker, Facebook might be great. You know, if you're performing in some sort of naked interpretive dance program that you don't want your grandma to go to, maybe it's best to stick to Instagram or in that instance, Snapchat. Uh, what networking events can you attend? You know, what, uh, what performances can you attend? Uh, generally, those opening nights or those, those uh, uh, opening night of, of a gallery exhibit, all those people that you want to network with, those people that you want to shake hands with, those, person that, those people that you want to give a business card to, they're going to be there. And it's all part of, of the hustle. I, I, I personally hate the word network because I, I like the word friendships. I would rather have friends than a network because network to me always indicates that there's some sort of ulterior motive or that uh, all my relationships are transactional. It's up to you. I mean, how you want to approach that. But I think, you know, being present, putting yourself out there, staying in contact, being top of mind means that you, you, you do have to go and shake hands and, uh, uh, talk with the people that, that uh, can influence your career. So exhibitions, trade events, all these are very important. Um, certainly uh, the Arts Council here in Baton Rouge does uh, a lot of events throughout the year. You're going to meet uh, a, a lot of interesting people that are gonna have connections that you might not have. Uh, you might have connections that they not, might not have, but uh, that's the beauty of those types of events is to really get there and share information and and form friendships. Now you need to determine what collateral you need uh, to, to reach people. Uh, so if I'm in the, one of these networking events, do I direct them to a website? Uh, that one works well for me. I keep, uh, as a writer, I, I keep a, uh, a creative portfolio online. You can check it out. It's andredubrock.com. 
uh, simple and expensive. I had to buy, I hate that I had to buy my name, andredubrock.com. I have to pay $99 a year to keep that name. And it's like, that's my name. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but the website is very, very helpful. Uh, and I have it divided up into the types of writing so that if somebody approaches me or sends me an email and says they're looking for something like this, I can give them, I can send them a link directly to the page that, that reflects what it is that they're asking for. Business cards. Um, I'm, I'm one of these people that rarely remembers to carry business cards with me, but then I'm always like, I wish I had my business card. So I'm trying to get better at that. But, um, and again, you know your audience is better. And if you think a business card would help, uh, direct them to a website, a portfolio, or at least a way to contact you. Get your descriptors on there, or, or uh, even on the other side, you know, let it reflect, uh, you know, if, if you're a visual artist and you want to go crazy with the design or the innovation of it, do that. Anything that reflects who you are, it's great. Um, a resume, um, generally uh, every actor, of course, has to have a, a resume or any uh, performing artist generally has to have a resume. Uh, the, the rules around that have been changing quite a bit. I've been seeing some very innovative resume building. Uh, been seeing a lot of interesting websites uh, for performing artists. I think particularly a website for performing artists that is looking to do film uh, so that they can have a video reel and stuff like that available. These are all things to think about. Uh, of course, yeah, that's down there, demo reel. Um, you know, photographs of your work, all of these things. And of course, when we talk about collateral, these are all tangible items that are going to require some investment on your uh, behalf. So how much you invest and where you invest that, of course, is up to you based on all the work that you've done up to this point. You've identified your audience, you've done your SWOT analysis, you know where it is that you wanna be, you know who you are, and you know how you wanna to, to relate that to others. So, you know, be smart with your collateral. I, I've met uh, a lot of actors who have done, or uh, not just actors, uh, I've met a lot of uh, artists who have done all of this, and they spent all of this money and, uh, did not see the return on it. And it's like, well, you set the bar high when you uh, purchase that much collateral. How do you stay top of mind? I think with social media, um, I've noticed that some people are, are great with social media and some people are just terrible. Um, be strategic about when and where you post. And if you're worried, uh, about drawing the line between yourself, your personal life, and your work as an artist, then I would very much recommend, you know, creating a fan page or an alternate account. Like I have on Facebook, Andre Dubrock author. What I post on Andre Dubrock author does not reflect what I would post as Andre Dubrock. Uh, I, I try not to cross those streams too much. Uh, that said, uh, it's, it's all visible to everybody for the most part. The internet is written in ink, not pencil. So be careful about what you post. People like to post a lot of political stuff these days, and that's great if your audiences, particularly that primary audience, is going to be aligned with your political view. That could be a bonding point. It could also be a, a point where you all part ways. So be, uh, just be smart. Uh, when with how and when you um, post on social media. Also think, you know, before you hit send, just look at it and ask yourself, what is the strength of this message? What am I hoping? What is the response I'm going to get from this message? And does it sound like me? And is it relevant to my audience? Then after that, uh, repetition and cadence. That doesn't mean that you have to post eight times a day. Most people would prefer that you didn't, um, but maybe two or three times a week. And that the message, that there's a repetition in, in its tone and its clarity and its, its cleverness and its reflection of you. You know, uh, people look forward to seeing your post. 
and uh, and the, they haven't had to wait four weeks for you to post again because they know that about every three days you're going to post. So that's the consistency. Remember, and sorry, Disney, <laughs> remember you are always building to affinity and beyond. You want to develop uh, an affinity uh, with your audience that uh, when your name comes up, oh, they do such good work. Oh, they're so funny. Did you see what they posted? Oh, I just love, I, I can't wait to work with this person. Oh, you know, that's what you're going for is that, that affinity. All right, now this, this might be a new term, even for some of the business people. MVP, consider MVP for an early revenue stream. MVP stands for minimal viable product. That's a saleable product or service that requires the minimum effort to produce. Uh, that sounds like laziness. No, it's not laziness, it's strategy. Uh, as a writer, I offer a service, I write. I have found a niche of writing greeting cards uh, for small greeting card companies all over the world. It requires minimum effort from me because greeting cards are generally very short. <clears throat> and, uh, and it's easily repeatable. You know, I can spend an hour on a Monday afternoon writing all my ideas out and sending it to them. And if they buy some of them, which generally they do, or uh, license some of them, which I love even more, then um, I've got a base revenue stream coming out from that. Is it a lot of money? No, not, a, not at much at first. Of course, with licensing, you, know, you build up royalty over time and then you, it, it just keeps increasing. I'm gonna put this in a visual artist um, scenario. Um, I have a friend who does ceramics and um, she has a small studio in Brooklyn and she creates amazing pieces. Uh, however, she's able to sell into gift shops these tiny little, um, I, know, I, I guess I would describe them as like spice containers. It's just a, a tiny little cup, enough, not even as big as a demitasse, but she can sell places to put spice. She can, she can make in, an, uh, in a day, probably produce 200 of these. And because she can do that, she sells, she sells them like crazy to any place that wants to buy them. So uh, another visual artist, uh, Rodrigue. Rodrigue's very good at, at, at doing what? Well, <clears throat> at, he was good at painting a, a blue dog. Well, that was, a sen in a sense, a minimal viable product because then he built his entire um, career off of that minimal viable product. So uh, I can't tell you what your MVP is going to be. Um, here's just some examples. You know, a sculpture, perhaps a simple ceramic casting of a unique design. You know, wouldn't, you be, wouldn't it be great if you were that first artist that, came up with uh, garden gnomes. You know, I'm, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life doing garden gnomes, but, but that's a pretty good minimal viable product. Um, painting, perhaps a set of watercolor prints or a calendar with a unique twist. That's things that you can sell throughout the year to help finance the work that you really wanna be doing. Music, establish a regular gig in a regular venue with a regular fan base, you know. Uh, I might not know where my next meal is coming from, but I know that I'm performing on Tuesday nights here for two hours. Uh, uh, literature, pick up freelance, freelance, freelance. I, I have freelanced and freelanced like crazy. And it's, it is hard at first, but uh, if you do good work, um, it just builds. Uh, and uh, you know, towards the end of my, my freelance career, I was having to say no to a lot of people, which actually feels really good. Um, performing, pick up a few nights of teaching or developing a workshop that can travel. Um, I know a lot of performing arts artists like dancers, you know, that at a moment's notice, they have a good one hour class that they've adapted for all age levels that they can go into any environment and teach. Same thing for actors or comedians or, or, or clowns, you know, 
if you, you have that strong one hour, you know, comedians, every comedian out there has their solid 10 minutes that they can do it at, at the drop of a hat. That is their minimum viable product. Film. Film, I would say freelance, because film is such a uh, competitive field. Freelance in any capacity as you form connections. Film is it's very multidisciplinary. The more you understand the big picture, pun intended, the more your, your big picture will get made. So it's, it's uh, you know, the minimum viable product for, for a person in the film industry might very well be your time, you know, where you're spending your time. Build on each success. Build on each relationship. Build on each contact. I'm not saying to not to be inauthentic. These are friendships, not networks. Um, and I, it's always worked for me to treat them as such. All right, so I'm gonna just review all of this because I am uh, talked quite a bit. Number one, scan the environment, look around you. Use what you see there to form your strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats analysis. And use that to develop your personal mission statement, the thing that's going to get you up every morning and understand who you are as an artist and how you are going to create a sustainable living as that artist. Know that when people ask what you do, you can say it in three bullet points as far as what your services or your goods are and followed up with a sentence about who it is that you are, are and what it is that you do. That, that one floor elevator speech. Identify your audiences. Know who, who's going to pay the money, who's going to influence the ones who's going to pay the money, and who are the people that are gonna be there to support you either which way and then figure out how you're going to reach that audience. Where do they live? Are they on social media? Uh, are they at, at events? You know, where do I need to align my message so that they see it and won't ignore it? How do I cut through that noise that we're all surrounded by? And then if, if applicable, you know, to try to figure out what is something repeatable, small, that I can do over and over again with minimum effort and maximum return. Uh, what's the little thing I can sell? What's the service I can provide that doesn't take me away from my big picture, but uh, sustains me in the meantime. So that that is it. I, I know that uh, this uh, presentation is recorded and I'm also going to give a copy of this slide deck, this, this insanely beautiful slide deck. I, again, I apologize, I'm not a visual artist. Uh, I'll make sure that Ashley and the Arts Council here has that uh, so that you can print it up. I, I do encourage all of you to uh, uh, take each of these steps and actually spend some time with a notepad outside of yourself really looking at yourself as, uh, as the sole proprietor of a business that has your name. As, uh, as an entrepreneur. And that's me saying thanks. And now I think we're gonna ask some questions or Ashley's gonna chime in and, yep. Yes, awesome. Thank you so much, Andre, for the incredible content. Um, this is just wonderful. We do have a few questions, so let me start. Um, how can you define your target market if you've already started selling to many demographic groups? Well, then, uh, all right, so it sounds like you've got lots of different, uh, um, um, a lot of different uh, demographic markets. So maybe not basing your, uh, your target market off of a demographic, but rather, you know, off of uh, the attributes of the people that are, are purchasing it. It might not be, uh, it might not be, you know, women between the ages of 25 and 45 that live in these zip codes, but rather, what is it, that, you're, what is it that, that all those different demographics have in common? And that might, you know, for instance, it might be 
well, all those women happen to, to have uh, small children at home or, um, or they're all uh, ironically divorced. Well, what's that about? You know, uh, you know, if you're selling to lots of different markets, you know, that might be some, some way that you try to pull them together and just to see who, who has the affinity for your brand. Okay, um, you've done so many things throughout your career. Can you talk a little bit about the need or lack thereof to focus on one career path at a time? Um, no, I, I don't think that you need to. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I've had many careers, but I've always been myself. And uh, uh, there's a wonderful um, book, um, and I'm trying to remember the author's name, but the, the, the title of the book is The Integration of Ability. Um, because, uh, all of, uh, all the things that I'm good at, um, and, and, and most of the things that I'm bad at, you know, they're all part of who I am and they've taken me down many, many different career paths, sometimes simultaneously. Uh, as far as this presentation goes and the work, uh, you know, break them down, you know, you know, as a writer, I have a minimum viable product of the greeting card. But as a performer, I have a minimal vital, uh, viable product uh, such as this presentation or uh, workshops that I've done with kids that I know that if I'm called in the next 10 minutes to go and do a workshop, I can do it because that's you know my MVP. And those are all uh, different career uh, or, or uh, different disciplines. Okay, um, is there any place for mission-centered entrepreneurship? Let's say your primary audience does not in fact hold the purse, in the case of like outreach programs, for instance. Um, no, all right, I mean, are we talking about social entrepreneurship? Um, I, I think she's, she's kind of talking about how the primary audience doesn't hold the, like they're not gonna, going to pay it's more of like an outreach program that you're doing in the community that you may um okay all okay. right well so uh, we use the expression buy-in you know so it, it you know it can be very literal to get people to buy into an idea you might literally want people to invest and when i was talking about the individual artists trying to sustain themselves that's what i, uh, I was talking about but however Buy-in also means that people believe or, or they're, they're, they get what it is that you're trying to do and they're there to support you with their time, with their talent, uh, with uh, not just their treasure. I, I think it still works that way, that if you are, you know, if you're trying to launch a mission program and you need community buy-in on that, all that messaging that you're doing, that SWOT analysis, it's also very relevant. You know, ultimate, just the goal is different. You're not asking, you know, you're not looking to financially, not looking for your audience to financially sustain you, but rather you're looking for them to, um, I guess, in a sense, emotionally sustain you because you know that they're going to be there and they value what it is that you're doing. Okay, I really, this is a really good one. Um, I hate when people post on GoFundMe for professional development opportunities in the arts. When a singer wants to go to a program in Italy, et cetera, is this kind of crowdfunding necessary? Is it frowned upon or is it viable? Is it a viable way to build up your business? Um, I think that ultimately comes down to if you know your audience. Um, uh, if, you know, <laughs> I mean, if somebody reached out and with uh, to me on social media with a GoFundMe, so that they could go and uh, to Europe and study the culinary arts for three years, um, I was like, "Well, I, I am probably not your audience for that," and I would probably uh, hold that notion in contempt. Um, the GoFundMe campaigns, they, I, I agree, they get a, a little bit out of hand and a bit excessive, uh, but again, it comes up, it comes to the person asking, understanding who their audience is. Um, personally, I, I don't think it's something I would use uh, to, to, to launch uh, an artistic endeavor. Um, uh, 
but uh, again, that's just up to the, the artist and who that audience is that they're targeting. Great. Can you talk a little bit about licensing and protecting intellectual property? Well, I'm not going to give uh, legal advice, um, but uh, as far as protecting intellectual property, um, there's some, uh, particularly with visual artists uh, and also literary artists, uh, I ran into this early in my career, uh, was that people will ask for spec work. In other words, uh, now before I do this, we have this project that we're working on and, um, you know, would you mind creating uh, something uh, to, uh, for us to work with? Like, um, you know, can you draw a logo that looks like this? And we want to just use that and see if that's something that we like. And then they'll, they'll take that and they'll reform it or never pay you. Or people that will ask you to, to perform to do or to uh, uh, be a musician at or draw or sculpt something because they're offering you exposure. Um, I would, I'm a professional and I'm 51 years old and if I haven't been exposed yet, it ain't getting exposed. So uh, I generally say no to all of those things. That's part of me protecting my own intellectual property, my own ability. Uh, as far as the logistics of protecting something that you've written, you know, date it. Uh, you don't need to, to run it through the copyright system. It's, it's fairly easy to prove in court. Um, uh, as far as licensing goes, um, uh, I personally uh, uh, prefer a, a royalty-based licensing agreement. Um, and for instance, um, I wrote a book uh, a, a few years ago that um, uh, ended up selling a lot more copies, like, like you know, uh, about 80,000 more copies than I ever thought it would. And, uh, but I uh, took an upfront, uh, upfront one-time fee for it. And uh, um, I'll always kick myself about that. So uh, I, th I would say when it comes to licensing, you know, uh, try to have some forethought about it before entering into a licensing agreement is like really read the terms of where and how things are going to be used. Um, I have a story of a friend of mine that was a model and signed a model release uh, with Getty Images and um, did not put any sort of restrictions on how his image could be used. And he's a ni nice guy, good looking guy, but he's also now the face of chlamydia throughout Minnesota on these billboards. <laughs> and so these are all things to think about. I guess, when it comes to licensing. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay. When should one decide to pull focus on their creative career rather than their day job? Or is that even the right way to think of it? Um, personally, I don't believe in setting dates or ultimatums with ourselves. Um, uh, in success, comes in waves. Uh, it's all very cyclical. Um, the day job, of, of course, can be very important. Um, like I said, at the end of the day, we have, we have to pay our bills and we have to pay our, our rents and our mortgages. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. I used to love acting and that was going to be my, um, my career. And it was my career for 16 years. I worked only almost exclusively in theater. And, but then I got to a point where I was actually resenting it because after 16 years, I didn't feel like I was making enough money or making enough headway in that field. And I started really holding, not, not just my uh, inability to, to sustain myself in it in contempt, but I was holding theater itself in contempt. And that's when I said to myself, I, I need to get out of this because I don't want to end up hating something I've always loved. 
And since then, I took time off and I've, I've uh, you know, gone back to it here and there. And I've always, I, I, I still love it. So that, for me, that was the smart decision. And I think that it's a very personal decision that all of us as artists have to make. Uh, but I, I, I'm not a big fan of, of setting ultimatums or, or due dates. Wonderful. Well, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you everyone for joining. We will have our next webinar Wednesday, March 27th, and the, talk, the, the topic will be Taxes 101 for Artists and Arts Organizations with Ralph Stevens. So mark your calendars. Andre, thank you so much for your expertise and your knowledge, and we're just really happy that you joined us today. Thank you so much. Thank you.